I'm not going to waste your time. In terms of the process, I'm going to call uh, our sponsor, one of our sponsors, and then immediately after him, I will call our chair, and then the chair will then call our keynote. Immediately after then, I'll come back, and then I will conduct the Q&A, um, and I know we're going to have an exciting time. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Bazalwan. Hallelujah, Bazalwan. Uh, I think we're going to have a good time. And I don't want to take much of your time. Um, and then after then, we will then call another sponsor just for five minutes. So we take a commercial break, and then they will just come and tell us what they do. They will wax the lyrical. And then after that, we go and network, we exchange numbers, whether they are wrong numbers or they are right but we exchange numbers. Yeah. Uh, whether it's an ID number, we exchange numbers. Yeah. Uh, whether it's your house address number, but let's exchange numbers. Um, and then we'll network, and then after we're done, then we'll make announcement. I'm going to call a guy called Sipo Mnyakeni. Sipo is the head of a company called Speakers University. Speakers University is part of... Um, you know, uh, subsidiaries as part of the companies that are within a, a company called Empower Works, which I happen to, you know, to be one of the directors of the business. Uh, we happen just to sponsor today's event, just to come and, and just work lyrical what they do and how you can benefit. Um, you know, he runs, he runs Speakers University. Let's give him a round of applause. Thank you so much. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I was supposed to speak for five minutes. I'll have that because we're looking forward to our guest to address us. We appreciate this event, which is an important event where ideas are shared, leadership journey is shared. For many of us, we're beginning the journey so that we can look forward and say, even though there are hurdles on the way, it's going to be okay because people like our guest speaker have made it past those hurdles. I'm from a company called the Speakers University, as Mr. Masiza has said already. And what we do, we do events, executive coaching on presentation skills, bespoke programs, keynotes, boot camps, and master classes. Uh, it's a space where we help people achieve their superstar speaking level. One of the other properties that we work on is called uh, the Speakers Fan. This is where we represent over 200 speakers in South Africa, the top in the game. So if you've got an event and you need a speaker to speak on any topic, we sure are able to provide that resource for you. These are some of the speakers that we speak, uh, that speak in our firm. In fact, we can even go beyond the borders of South Africa to give you the best in the land. One thing I want to note before I sit down is that I was reading a couple of months ago that in the past, education used to compose of seven subjects. One of those subjects was rhetoric. It was part of the fundamental subjects. In other words, if you are educated, you must have that thing, the ability to present, to speak in public. In the past, speaking in public was one of the signs that you are educated. If you sat with people, the discussions that took place there separated between the sheep and the goats, those who are quiet, who know nothing, or who can't say what they know. And so what we do is to empower people with that, which is a social capital skill that they really need. The purpose of communication is to communicate. If you stand up and you speak in front of people and they do not hear what you said, you must go back to the drawing board. When I was young, I was shy, very shy. I'm not sure if you can see a picture of my face there. 
Let's go forward a little bit. If you can believe it. The first picture, it's me, shy. The second picture, one day, my teacher says to me, the debate team needs one member. I'm not in school uniform. But you need to be in school uniform. But he says, you know what? Come, Sipo. I know you don't like speaking, but we need one man. You can just stand there and say nothing. Just give us one more person. I went there, shy as I was. I had no friends. I was particularly afraid of speaking to human beings who were of the other gender. <laughs> and so I went there, I spoke, or I spake. And when I left the stage, something happened to me that I'll never forget. I was able to speak to Gwendolyn. <laughs> Gwendolyn, I've been trying to speak to her all my life. <laughs> and this is how it went. When I saw her, I said to myself, let me go speak to Gwendolyn. And when I got to Gwendolyn, I don't know, something within me said, don't do it. <laughs> and I never did it. But that day, I didn't have to do anything. Gwendolyn came to me, and she spoke to me, and she became my friend. Gwendolyn became my friend. Nomalanga became my friend. Lindy became my friend. <laughs> Let me conclude by saying the, the, the courses that we provide include, um, we do, I, I mentioned that we do customize uh, coaching, we have a public program. If you look at in your chairs, there's a postcard there with our program. And the courses that we do, the dates are there. You can call us for the fees. Creating an impactful keynote signature talk. Some people have got great stories, but they don't know how to share them. So we'll teach you how to take your story and package it so that when you speak in an, to an audience, they can look at you and say, we want to be like you, advanced presentation skills, PowerPoint presentation skills, that's one skill that most of executives and leaders and managers need to work on. Because most PowerPoints have got bullets. Have you noticed? And have you noticed that when you speak using a PowerPoint, people die? Can you make the link between your bullets and people dying? <laughs> so we are saying to people, ditch the bullets. Make your PowerPoint exciting. Let them tell stories. This is the things that we do at Speakers Universities. I look forward to the presentation by the guest. I hope you too look forward to it. But I also look forward to you contacting us. You can talk to me during the networking to see what we can do for you, your company, or your organization. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Vice Chancellor. Thank you, Rector of Speakers University. I'm not going to waste much of your time. I'm going to call the chair, Ndate Morris Khadebe, to introduce our guest speaker for this evening. Let's give him a round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. Let's give him a round of applause. We can do much better. Than that. As you all know, we need to always pray for our nation. So we're going to stand up and pray for our nation. Have you got it on the screen? Go. Let's go. Let's pray.
You may be seated. Let me welcome everyone that is here. I see so many friendly faces and very familiar faces. It's great to see all of you. I can see all the partners and the National Mentorship Movement, Dave, and all the teams that work together. There's a new partner that we're having. We're having a, a ULP a governance program. Deborah is here in the team, so we're working with Simpiwe and all the others, and all the partners that work with us in the Empower Works, uh, Simpiwe. Uh, let's give him a round of applause with all the great work that we're doing. And uh, all the, as I always say, ULP, we are open to partnerships and uh, working together. I saw Silema Confidence here, yeah, he's also here. He's partnering with us on teaching uh, leadership uh, uh, courses uh, to young leaders, a lot of uh, partners. Uh, there's many people that are here that I would like to acknowledge, but that will take too much time. I just want to, no, 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 just come up front so that they can see you. Uh, no, no is uh, uh, running this place now. Uh, give her a round of applause. I want them to, so that they can see your face. Turn around. Give it a round of <laughs> Then you, you, you can sit down and can talk about it. Thank you. The, uh, if you want to uh, sponsor this event, uh, we will be having a number of events, in, and I'll speak about them at the end. Uh, speak to Nono uh, so that you can contribute and we can share about your company and it will be exposed. Thank you very much for the Speakers University for your sponsorship. We also have a marketing team, uh, Marketing Fi, they will speak at the end, who have also sponsored this event. So thank you very much. Let's thank, let's thank the sponsors. I'm very pleased uh, to today. Uh, Ugutu Baba uh, Umanuel is with us. We really thank you for taking time from your busy schedule. I know how hectic here is uh, your life. And uh, I've been speaking to, her, to him for some time now. Thank, thank, thank Anneli. Anneli's been very good. Uh, she's really been good, your PA. Uh, she, he doesn't need any introduction. He's been in public domain for many, many years. He's a servant of our nation for many, many years. Uh, as you can see there on the screen, he, he's got a BTEC, AAPM, and the Deep and uh, EMP, but he's more spent time working for this nation. Currently, he's the chairman of uh, uh, Old Mutual and is a non executive uh, and independent director of Swiss RELT, independent non executive director of SAB Miller. Uh, some of this we picked it up from the uh, uh, Google, so they may be out of date, but so you must correct me if uh, 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 Deputy Chairman of Rothschild, that one I know is still there, uh, still in, and, and also Chancellor of the Cape Peninsula, so he's very passionate about education, Professor Ed Extraordinaire at the University of Johannesburg, and uh, those are the roles which he played uh, outside uh, his day-to-day -day work. But he's been a minister from 1996 to 2009. There was a time where you were long, 94. From 1994 to 2009. Uh, correct me. To 2014. To 2014, you see? So there was a time where I, how they were looking at national, uh, global financial ministers and you were no longer serving. <laughs> so he's got a record of serving. <laughs> <laughs> See, you must correct the, the, the 1994 to 2014. Yeah? So we, we and he was, oh, so for, for 20 years, a minister in, in the head, in our, in our government. And uh, it's really great to have that kind of experience. And he's been leading the National Planning Commission, and he's done a great work in that. 
I can go on and on and talk about uh, uh, Manuel. And he's also served the international community, which is great, in the United Nations uh, uh, Commission for uh, Trade and Development, the World Bank, IMF, African Development Bank. And this is what we encourage here at ULP, that you must not think, because was a little cat he, you know, that was my ambition when I was young. And then I was like, 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 I was And many people are like that. Uh, uh, and we need to get out and be international global leaders. And that is what we are. We are, we are called to do, and the opportunities for us, the world is actually waiting for us. I must say that uh, uh, I've just come out from Europe. It's such refreshing uh, to be back in the, in the community and then to also introduce our president, uh, and everybody says, oh, that's great, and it's very good uh, to be in that space. So we can, we, 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 we can make a global contribution as South Africans. And we need to reclaim that space. Right, I'm not going to read this whole CV. It's long. I'm going to call him Baba Trevor Andrew Manuel. Thank you. Thank you. It's okay. It's okay. It's a, please sit down. If I, if I say something you like, then later you can applaud. But now you don't even know. Um, Bab Khadebe, thank you very much, and may I thank the ULP for the invitation, and may I also express my sincerest admiration for what you do. I think the value of this unique arrangement uh, will be seen in the fullness of time, uh, will be appreciated by those who make the time to join and learn together. Um, I, you know, talking about leadership is very hard because uh, I think when I look around the audience here, uh, everybody's literate, everybody can read, you can pick up a book on leadership and so uh, trying to do that over and over is uh, not going to be much value. Um, the other issue is that sometimes people initiate uh, wonderful competitions. There's a, there's a competition I read about in the newspapers, uh, Unleashing Young Mandelas. And then you see people think that uh, what Mandela was about was a hairstyle. <laughs> and so, uh, but that's not what this is about. <laughs> And of course, the, the big issue, when I look at the long list of luminaries who have stood at this lectern and shared ideas with you, the only, the only point to make about that is that you're not going to have two people created in exactly the same situation. The key for me is what the core values are that you bring with you and how you test those values. The other thing that's, that's difficult is to talk about myself. But I'll just say something to, to introduce a topic and then, so that we have a conversation. I want to confine my comments to observations that are dealt with in, in respect of five questions. Just five questions. So let me start. I grew up in a township called Kensington in Cape Town. When I was born and raised, same, constant family, uh, uh, like Katlehong. It was, in fact, I was there the weekend, uh, my mother's 93rd birthday. My mother still lives in the same house where I was born. And that story would not be, would not be unique in townships. Yeah. Families are like that. Uh, and that was a township we grew up in. 
Uh, my first political awakening came in the early 60s when half of our community was emptied out when white government trucks came and moved our neighbors away to a place that was then called Nyanga West, which today is Guguletu. So suddenly, a community that was there was separated by the Group Areas Act, reshaped. Uh, my mother had also sent me to school early. I started sub A before I was five. And so <clears throat> our classes were emptied in much the same way. Now that is a political awakening that happens, that compels children to ask questions about themselves, about neighbors. And I think those issues have become important in my life. Young activist involved in the community. Um, the first question I want, to, I want to raise is who am I? You've seen my name and all that stuff. That's not what I want to talk about. The, the big issue, the big issue, and I think it's, it's, it's been a very important force in my life, is identity. What apartheid wanted to do was to classify me as either colored or non-European. That was a designation we grew up with. And I wasn't going to be non-anything. I needed identity. And one of the big historical forces of my youth was the black consciousness movement. And the basic tenet of BC was you're part of the problem or you're part of the solution. And being part of the solution became a force because it also allowed me to identify as black. And that I think was, was, was life changing for me. The fact that I could relate to other people, other oppressed people, and act together. And you can, you can then trace what happened politically. You can trace uh, our footsteps. Our, and they were, they were baby steps in the, in the black consciousness movement. Uh, and how we were able to carry that forward into the way in which we shaped the United Democratic Front, and the way in which we continue to build unity amongst oppressed people. So the question of identity is fundamentally important to me because when I look back, it's important to understand that identity is not destiny. You see, one of the big challenges that we have as a country is to forge unity and togetherness and purpose. And you can't do it unless you focus on identity. And for me, amongst the most heart-wrenching difficulties are when you stop at a traffic light and they're selling, they're actually selling and people are buying bumper stickers that say 100% Zulu, 100% vendor, because that's not identity. That takes us away from the objective of what is required by our constitution. Along the lines, of course, we were able to internalize values of the, of the Freedom Charter, which brought different dimensions. But you see, if you have that identity, and even in the context of non-racialism, you can understand both employment equity, why it's important, and you can understand broad-based black economic empowerment. And you engage with these things, and they don't present a contradiction. But if you don't engage with your own identity, then I think these things become difficult in society. And amongst the things that I think presents a difficulty is this retreat into tribalism away from our responsibility 
as a nation of South Africans. Now bear in mind that we've taken a hard road to get there. In the formation of Tanzania, uniting Tanganyika and Zanzibar, they did away with all of the languages. And uh, Mwalimu insisted on Kiswahili as the lingua franca. So that you had a single language that united all people living in that country. You remember Samora Michelle in, in, in Mozambique said, for the nation to rise, the tribe must fall. We in South Africa opted to take a route that is a bit more complex because uniquely we have 11 official languages so we can relate. We can relate to who we are. We can, we can fall back into tradition and language but at the same time we must be able to transcend so that we can unite. So for me one of the key challenges that we have to engage with on a continuous basis is that question of identity of ourselves as a nation of South Africa. So that's, that for me is the, is the first issue. The second question is what do I want to achieve? And this is not a fixed thing. The things I wanted to achieve at the age of 18 were not the same at the age of 13, not the same at the age of 40. But even today, what I'd like to maximally do is to be in service. And you see, one of the <clears throat> One of the most destructive forces in a country like ours is when the first purpose that people say they have is to become wealthy. All I want is to have a lot of money. But you can't have money as an objective. You can have it as a means, but it can't be an objective. So when you see some of these things, there, there are these, these uh, people, a family, uh, what were they called? Uh, something billionaires the other day. Underground billionaires, what? Yeah? And, and, and you see that, that they've been able to take so much money from people who think that that is how you get rich. But wealth is not built like that. And, you know, there are always, I mean, what did, what did uh, Mark Twain or one of those clever people say? Uh, the lotto is for people who don't know mathematics. <laughs> There'll only be a limited number of winners ever. The rest are contributors to that one individual and to the wealth of other people. So, wealth Mere, mere accumulation of wealth can never be an objective. There are a series of other things we have to do and most of the things that we need to do in a country like ours involves plowback and it takes a very, very long time. I mean, Bab Khadebe here, we were talking before, we came in and he said, okay, so people look at me and say, oh, he's at the top of Sasso. But it's taken 30 years in the industry to reach the top. And sometimes, because we don't understand purpose and we look at the size of the hubcaps, the length of the swimming pool, the flash of the suit, how close they are to this or that pastor, because we think that that's what these issues are about, we end up finding ourselves in enormous difficulty. And, you know, you can, you can try this in whatever way you like, but I don't think you change the rules of, of, of economics, including the way in which wealth is generated and accumulates. Unless you all volunteer 
to become cash in transit droppers or something. <laughs> but the laws of economics won't allow you to do that. So I'm saying the second issue is what do I want to achieve? What is my purpose? The third issue, which has been very important for me, is who do I do this with? The cult of the individual has never quite found resonance in the country. I know that there's a lot more of it now. Go and read the speeches of Nelson Kholislatla Mandela. And look at the number of times he used the word, the pronoun I. It was like he couldn't say it. He said we. And if you were to ask him, Tata, don't you mean, don't you mean you? He'd say no we. Because that is so fundamentally important. How we build teams becomes the way in which we defined. Because it's in building teams that we can divide responsibility and create accountability for what we do. It doesn't matter if you want to run an organization like this, you need a team to do it. If you want to build a strong business, you need a team to do it. And whether it's a large listed company or a small business, it's the checks and balances that are provided by your comrades in that team. You want to build a political organization, you need a team. And so who you do things with becomes fundamentally important. And I think it's a lesson that, you know, as was, was part of our shaping. And sometimes these teams, you know, if I, if I look at the team who were there with us in August 1983 when we launched the UDF, some of us has, have, have kind of fallen out politically, but we, we can still call each other and remain friends, notwithstanding. You know, the big driving force of that U, UDF was uh, Musiwe Lakota. So, you know, he's done interesting things and so on and so on. But I can still call him up and say, hey, Tara, you can't do this, man. Who is a Steve Hoffman you're hanging out with and why? I can do that. I can do that because we've, we've been involved in stuff together. You know? Bobo Mulife was the general secretary. Vali Musa, Murphy Morobe. Cheryl Carolus, we were a team of young crazies, you know. The bulk of us were in our 20s when we did these interesting things. But that's when you're fearless and that's when you begin to cast the die for what happens in your life. I'm saying, but without teams, you will not achieve these things. The fourth issue for me that's important is how do I relate to you? And how would I like you to relate to me? And this is about, it's about respect. It's not about money. It's not about, it's not about authority. It's about respect. And respect works if it's a mutual function. The essence of respect is boot. But it has to shape. You see, for me, that is core. Respect is core. And because I know I want to be respected, if somebody disrespects me, then we will have a fundamental disagreement. I don't care how loud your voice or what color boiler suit you wear. Please don't disrespect me. And I will earn that right by always respecting you. And a difference of opinion should not allow us to ever disrespect one another. Yeah. 
And the last question is, <coughs> what do I stand for? You know, I think, and this is why I say you can't, you can't just take one set of circumstances and impose it on other people or other generations. If you look at the challenges that the Ravonia trialists were put under, None of them, I mean, none of them started out saying, look, I'm, I'm going to die doing this thing. But when the, when the challenges arose, and out of the Ravonia trial, it's the person who has provided the best, the best texture to how they faced these issues was actually Uncle Kathy. You know? When your lawyers sit with you and they say, <clears throat> look, uh, uh, it looks like the death penalty. How do you respond? Now, fortunately, we had some challenges, but they weren't the same kinds of challenges. But detention and the risk of imprisonment was always there through a big chunk of my life. You couldn't waver at the responsibility. You knew what you stood for and you knew that by your actions you will empower other people. It arises differently today. But I think unless we know who we are and what we stand for, it's impossible to convene other people around us. And I think that is the challenge of leadership. It's the ability to convene other people around you. And you can't do so merely by having a lot of money. And you can't do so by sitting on your own. And you can't do so by being entirely on your lonesome. And you can't do so unless you know what matters. And it's these basic things which I think have been important in bringing me to where I am today. It's an imperfect route. It's not a prescripted route. But I can go back, I can look, I can ask myself the tough questions about whether I've been conscious in my decisions. Could I have done things differently? Frequently? Yes. But you see, the, the biggest downfall of leaders is when they stop thinking or, th or consider that they've reached a point where they are then irreplaceable or untouchable. Mm -hmm. And you can only do that if you are exceedingly conscious of what those responsibilities are. So, as you saw on the screen earlier, and as Bob Khadebe said, I, I was placed in the unique position of being finance minister for 13 years. The 96 to 2009 was when I was finance minister. Two years before that, I was minister of trade and industry, and five years after that, I was minister in the presidency for the National Planning Commission. But in that period, um, I just want to talk about what, what is, I think, been a very difficult experience in our political life in this country. In September 2008, Thabo Mbeki was removed as president. Now, this is when you get 
people who don't think about consequences. This was happening in the same month as Lehman Brothers collapsed and as the global economy came apart. Those who were so determined to get rid of an individual stopped to think about the quality of life of all people and what we needed to do. And so, Tabombeki, I mean, the decision was taken by the NEC, and then on the same morning that he was told, the NEC arrived at this conclusion at 2 a.m. Same morning by 7, I handed him my letter of resignation. Not that I was being silly about this. So I stood there with two big individuals, uh, Jacob Zuma, who was the president of the ANC, and his deputy president, Khalima Mutlante. And I gave them copies and I said, I've resigned. <coughs> And they said, no, you must withdraw it. I said, no, no, no. You see, I'm quite clear about this in my mind. When I was invited to serve on the National Executive, when I was nominated to serve on the National Executive Committee of the ANC, I was given a form to sign acceptance. When I wanted to become a member of parliament, I was given a form to sign acceptance. But to become a minister, you are appointed by the president. There's no acceptance form. So the pleasure of the president is fundamentally important because that what's that's, that's the energy that constructs a team. So uh, I, I knew what was going to happen in the week. In fact, I had to leave for New York on that same Saturday. I knew that Parliament would convene and that Mkulwa uh, would, be, would be nominated and elected president. Uh, that's uh, former President Mutlati. And he said, no, you must. I said, no. I said to him, he wasn't president yet, so I could still call him Mkulwa. I said, Mkulwa. Um, <laughs> I, 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 today, I've been serving at the pleasure of Thabo Mbeki. If you'd like me to continue serving, ask me. I will not refuse you or the movement. But you must know that I serve in a cabinet of your choice. So I went to New York, and I was traveling from New York to Washington on the Tuesday morning when my phone ran off the hook because the, my, my letter of resignation had leaked. And the one thing I realized then was that I'd been doing this thing for so long that my personality and the portfolio became intertwined. And the discussions we had thereafter was that that is bad for democracy. And come February the following year when we were preparing then for this is now 2009, preparing for, for Parliament. I didn't want to sign an acceptance, a nomination acceptance form. And I sat with, with uh, Shulozi and, and uh, Mkwati, uh, that's uh, Gwede, and we sat together and, and then uh, they said, uh, but you haven't signed this form? And I said, no, because I don't want to go back as a Minister of Finance. And I want that thing to be taken off the table because we mustn't imperil our democracy because the markets say this or that. We must have the freedom of choice. And we must separate personality from that freedom. And we sat that evening and, and, and The man from Kandla said, all right, can I tell you, I'll need you to do something else which will not be the Ministry of Finance. Will you then sign the acceptance form, which we then did? You see, because we must know what we stand for, we must know what we represent, we must know what we want to achieve, and we must be able to extricate ourselves so that we don't believe that we become infallible or irreplaceable. 
And that, I think, is a, is a big challenge now. Now, I'm saying you can't script this thing into the lives of other people. But at every step of the way, it's important that we be quite cerebral about what we're doing and how we're doing it. And the bulk of, of my ability to engage, especially because, you know, I, you won't find economics degrees amongst what I have. But I, I was able to work, especially in those 13 years in the, in the uh, Ministry of Finance, for the most remarkable team of people. Young, capable, strong, strong-willed people who understood that we will meet at least every fortnight and spend a lot of time together. And there wasn't a single person in that team who didn't ever feel confident to be able to express a view that was different to that of the minister. And I think that that was, that was a formidable strength. It was able to build a pipeline of people who had, who had values. I didn't ever own them. They had values, they had core. Together we were able to construct something that was quite remarkable. And on the way through, in those 13 years, almost each of those individuals knew that they could leave the public service go into the financial services sector and write their own checks. But they would work with public service salaries because it was a dream that was bigger than any of the individuals. And to have worked with people like that, and some of them have fallen off and so on and so on, uh, um, and some of them have grown stronger and stronger, but to have worked with a team of people like that and learnt and engaged and be held to account because they became the guardrails around me. To have worked with a team of people like that, I mean, you know, people remember me as a Minister of Finance, I would have been nothing if it wasn't for that formidable team of people. And you can go and look at where they are today. They were strong, strong world, but they were committed to work together as a team. And I think it's that that I offer you, because regardless of where you find yourselves, that, that ability to subject yourself to the accountability of those around you, even if you're not at quite the same level, is actually a strength that we should multiply. Why? because it is so true to what defines us as Africans. So let me stop there and have a conversation. Thank you very much. You. I just want to... Can I have water? Uh, okay, thank you so much. Yeah, you can sit. Yeah, yeah okay. Thank you so much. No, no, it's fine. Yeah. Thank you. We'll take three questions. Um, can I start this side? Directed. Their name when they ask the question, please. Okay. My sister, I think we all know the rules. Don't repeat the speech. Yeah, just direct to Don, Don Samai, which has a question. Or, you know, because we want to. Okay, even the ones online will, will also take questions. Just, just take, okay. My sister, there you are noted. Okay. We wanted to take three. My sister, my brother, uh, my brother. In, the, in that order. My sister, my brother, my brother. Okay. It's your turn. Hi, my name is Lungi. My question is, what do you think is the crisis of this generation? So you had to fight for freedom for those who are oppressed, what do you think we have to fight for? Okay. It's pity, pity. It's a new generation. This <laughs> okay. and, uh, and then we'll go to my brother. My, my
My name is Bungane. The, the question I have uh, for you, former minister, is that how did you allow the legacy that you have spoken so nicely about to be misconstrued ideologically and politically and be viewed in a different light than where, what you, you, you stand for? Are you fine? <laughs> Thank you so much. But then the last one, the last one. Hey, good day, Mala. Good day, Miss Long. Yes, sir. And then we are, we are the last one. Then we'll allow, we'll allow you. Yeah. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, Fundo uh, my, my question is South Africa is in a crisis of ethical, uh, ethical, authentic leaders. And what would you say to those who say South Afri African leaders have sold Africa? to the highest bidders because of personal wealth that you spoke about and compromised the mandate that they've got for the people of Africa. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's your turn. Thanks. Uh, Bungani, the, the, the thought that uh, your question was, was off limits. There are no questions off limits this evening. <laughs> Lungi, the, part of what I, I tried to, to, to explain was that we were part of movements that were bigger than ourselves. I think that one of the big changes that has taken place is what sociologists will call the atomization of South Africans. We are all individuals. And so common purpose becomes exceedingly difficult. So that's the first issue. But the individualization or atomization also goes further because with changes in communication, especially the availability of social media, there's far more instant gratification. And in that environment, you can factor in certain forces that, that drive change differently. You look at the prosperity religions. If you are a person of, of humble means, then it must be that God has frowned on you. And all around, in communities, these are the issues that confront people. And I think that, that, that part of an opportunity like this is to ask what we can do together, how we can redefine purpose, how we can redefine service. Because, um, you know, if you look at the, the areas where most of us grew up. I think many of us would be afraid to go there at this time of day. No. Many of us would be afraid to go there. We'll go and visit our families and hang out and wash our cars and dry meat on a Sunday at lunchtime and then we withdraw from there again. And we do this for ourselves and we, we haven't quite figured how, what about those who have no choice in this matter? And that I think is about the redefinition of purpose. There's not something imported from elsewhere, it's about how we live and how we relate uh, and, and who our kith and kin are and how we, we keep our sisters and brothers. Bungani, there's no limit to ideological terminology. You know, one of the most difficult challenges that faced us was in that first year that I was Minister of Finance, 
six. Now bear in mind, the apartheid regime had a lot of debt. Thankfully, we were spared foreign debt because of sanctions and disinvestment. So the last thing that it had from the World Bank was in 1967. And there was a loan, small loan negotiated under debt relief from the IMF in 1993 with all of the parties, including the PAC and everybody involved in agreeing at small and democracies around the corner. And so we end up in a situation and I, I see the then president who has now appointed me and He asks me how things are going, and I say to him, Mr. President, there's a, the, the problem is that if we continue on this trajectory, by 1998, the largest item on our budget would be debt service costs. So Madiba didn't ever pretend that he was an economist, but he had a kind of, he had a, a rare ability to see things and ask questions in the way that they presented. So he says, uh, but, but, but who, who is this money owed to? Do you think I must call Harry Oppenheimer and <laughs> tell him cancer? I say no, but the money is not owed to Harry Oppenheimer, it's owed to workers and pensioners because the money has been taken out of pension funds, prescribed assets. And he says, if we cancel that, then people will have nothing. No, we must never touch the money of working people. So that's where a discussion starts. Not big economics, but a lot of rationality in what he's saying to me. And he says, but Gee whiz, he likes saying gee whiz. Uh, he says, if it's debt service costs, that money's already been spent. Yes, the money's spent. We are now paying interest on that debt. He says, uh, but you know, democracy is about the future. And if we're spending more on the past than the future, if we're spending more on debt service than on education, we are doing something fundamentally wrong because we are cutting off opportunities from our children. So we say, so he says, no, we must do something about it. So I go away and find a team and we work, work, work. And, uh, we realize that the only way to do this is actually to cut the deficit because the deficit is not capital spending. A lot, is, a lot of it is on consumption if we cut the deficit, we'll be able to cut through this. After a little while, we'll be able to regain. So the modeling is done. Go back to the president. And he says, fine. You go and do this, and we will back you. And he says to the deputy president, Tabo, you go with them. And so that, that became gear. The objective was very clear over what we had control. It was for growth, employment, and redistribution. But you know, the big lesson is you don't have control over all the levers. So when the Reserve Bank, and we didn't have control over the Reserve Bank, when they built up what was called a net open forward position of $27 billion, they had to increase interest rates. And so the idea that you could create employment, especially support small businesses by lower interest rates, was gone. And when the following year there was an Asian crisis and the RAND fell out of bed, it was gone. So what you can control and how you communicate became an important lesson from that. We battled through that, and I, I, I'll stop at this point. 
1997, the ANC had a conference in, in Mahikeng. And of course, this was very topical because gear was adopted 18 months earlier and there were all of these nice songs, Asifuni Gia, and so on and so on. And <laughs> but, but, but as a movement, we had to engage with these issues. And if you go back to the resolution of that conference, if the ANC website is up again, you will find it there. <laughs> The resolution says that the policy, the socio-economic policy of the African National Congress is the reconstruction and development program, full stop. Gear is the macroeconomic means to attain it. It didn't replace it. You see? But if you want socio-economic policy, if you want to build schools and educate people and build houses and build clinics and so on and so on, then you need a stable macroeconomy. Well, you know, uh, those, those debates were never quite settled, even though it's in an ANC resolution of the 50th conference, Mahikeng, December 1997. Mfundo, do you say Mfundo? I didn't hear. You know, there is this, this enormous difficulty. Bear in mind that after a long history, which was classically a neo-colonial history, when Leaders served foreign masters and so on and so on. There came a time, and it, it was only from around the turn of the century that there was a cadre of leaders on the continent who started to lead a different process. Amongst, amongst the, the things that, or amongst the decisions that this core group of leadership took was to replace the OAU with the African Union. So the constitutive act of the African Union was the beginning, ought to have been the beginning of bigger changes on the continent. The second thing was that Leaders eventually agreed that we need partnership with the North. We don't have all the financial resources. We need partnership. And if we want partnership for development, then we must be prepared to commit certain things. That, that big partnership agreement is NEPAD, of course. And amongst the things that leaders agreed to, was the African peer review mechanism. And this commission was set up and they'd visit countries. And they came here to South Africa and said to us, look, please don't expect to be judged on the same basis as Djibouti or Burkina Faso. In relative terms, you're a developed country, and we will judge you according to standards that are not the same as the poorest African countries. And the big idea was that leaders would hold the feet of each other to the fire so that we always developed our own norms and standards. And there was a group of about eight heads of state who were core to this. One of the big challenges, of course, in dealing with this is that most constitutions have term limits. And when people try and tinker with constitutions to extend their term limits, then you have the beginning of the end. One of the, the, the leaders who was core to all of these developments was President Bouteflika in Algeria. 
But he's been there for a very long time now. And you look at the events every single week in Algeria because he overstays his welcome. And when people try and amend constitutions, then other people lose respect for them and for constitutions and for the normalcy of political life. And also, of course, if we don't, maybe it's not always true, but the idea was that you must remunerate leaders properly, right? understand you will not go into politics to get wealthy, but you must at least be comfortable. Remunerate leaders properly, ensure that when they leave office, they can continue their work and have enough of an income. You can look at our constitution that provides for that. But you know, there's no, there's no limit to how much wealth is enough for some people or what they will give away in the process. And that, I think, has been our undoing. You can only deal with this issue if you have strong, mobilized communities, active citizens who stand up and say no. And that, I think, is, is the big story. And then they must be able to stay the course. You see, because the Arab Spring started in Egypt, remember. And when the opportunities came for election, First, the Muslim Brotherhood was elected and they were overthrown and then people were happy with the military generals back in power. So we've got to rethink how these things work. And I'll also I'll end by saying that you know, this thing called democracy doesn't always produce the best outcomes. I mean, look at Donald Trump and <laughs> then... <laughs> But it's something we have to continue engaging with because what worked before will no longer work now. How do you create inclusive societies? How do you define the objectives of that? If you look at the values articulated in our constitution, you don't have to read very far, just read the preamble. A commitment to raise the living standards of all citizens and to free the potential of each person. It's, a, it's one of the early commitments on the first page of our constitution. Now, you know, when you raise the living standards of people, you can't do it once. You can't say, I take you out of your chombe and I now put you in an RTP house. I've raised your living standards. What happens thereafter? And you can't free the potential of each person unless you fundamentally deal with education. Because our potential will remain uncovered, or sorry, underdeveloped, unless you can close, narrow the gap between education for the rich and education for the poor. Now, we, we, we must hold our own values up against ourselves and say, why are we failing? It's not always because of foreign interest. It's because we violate our own rules. Thanks, Mfundo. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay, we'll go online, which is going to take two. Two questions? Okay. Okay, because we're streaming live. Yes, okay. Let's take two questions. Okay, um, the first question online uh, related to the point you just made on education. What is your view regarding free education? Are we as a country in a position to implement free education for all? That's coming from Tapelo. And then the next question from Tami. How, is your how in your experience do you think an economy with high unemployment, small and shrinking middle class expenditure, low collection of taxes, turn around the economy at a growth of s at 6 to 9 percent in the next 24 to 6 months, th 36 months, sorry. Thank you. Can we take two additional? Yeah. That's okay. And then two we'll take the last one. Okay, let's take with my sister. Um, let's, uh, let's take the one at a, a move on, my sister, and then at the back. And then we, I'm going to come back to for the last set of questions. And then Abanya, you'll ask uh, online. <laughs> 
Yes, it's, it's yours. Uh, thanks. Uh, my name is Pumi from Bloomberg News. Um, Both, a bit of both. I mean, my sincerest apologies in advance if this is not the time or place to ask this. But, I mean, you mentioned once in a Bloomberg article that it's sort of important, you know, for the situation with Peter Moyer to be managed. So I'm just, I, well, it was quote, okay. Okay, so can I do it later? I can't do it now. I'll explain why I can't. All right, that's okay. Thank you. Alright, I still don't know about move. It's what I see now. What's about to recognize? Yes, my sister. Um, Mr. Manuel, uh, thank you so much for bracing us with your presence. I think I'm quite honored to be here. Good evening, everyone. Mpomo Khatla here. Um, I'm just quite interested to find out um, the decision making process in terms of. Um, the decisions that you were making in the ministry, I mean, you say that you were not a subject matter expert in finance, but how did you get the buy-in of the minister, your fellow colleagues, um, the presidency? You know, I'm just quite interested to find out what the decision-making process and your team, um, how, how were you, you know, communicating with your team and how did you know that this was the right decision um, to take? Let's take the last one because we're replacing uh, my, my sister. Uh, I hope you don't mind. Not at all. Okay. Let's do that. Okay. Uh, hi. Back. Thank you for the talk. My name is Tugida. So the question I have is um, in the face of ethical decay in leadership in South Africa, what guardrails did you put up for yourself in all your leadership positions to ensure that you always lived and led according to your values, no matter what it cost you? Yes, girl. <laughs> yes, girl. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Tapelo uh, isn't, uh, I mean, this was an online question. You know, look, I would hope that we would reach a stage where universal free education is available. But I think that the difficulty with the decision has been that it was announced outside of the norms of taking considered advice. And the problem, the problem is actually not at university level. They may, university students may have the loudest voice. But if I said to you this evening that, you know, up to grade four, up to grade four uh, education is in mother tongue. And they've run certain tests and 64% of children at the end of grade four can't read for meaning. If you can't read for meaning after four years of schooling, you're not going to read for meaning after 10 years of schooling because ideas become more complex. So when we talk of university students, it's a minority of a minority and you can see how steep the curve is in fall off in high schools especially. So how do you begin to change the demography of throughput in education is an important question. Or the other lingering problem, and these issues don't disappear. You know, in 1953, Hendrik Verwood said, we must not teach the black child mathematics and, mathematics and science because it will make them think of a station in life that they will never attain. So you took out generations of maths teachers in Bantu education. And if you look at the outcome of that, even now, you look at the difficulty of students, uh, uh, learners in grade five, and their inability to multiply by a single digit number, to add and subtract. 
so that the idea that later they will get into fractions and be prepared to deal with calculus is impossible. The problem with this issue is that it continues the burden of the black child. It's not a discussion we're having in this country. But unless we deal with it early and we, ch and the big divide happens in, in early childhood development already. And that's why parents will spend more for good, competent ECD sometimes than they'll spend on university education. Because that's where the real divide happens. These are the discussions we must have and, and Apello, my, my, my sense of it is that you can't isolate university education and not look at the whole of education and what we're doing to nation building by denying these things. It's not always a question of money because relative to upper middle income countries, our education is still, public education is still funded at the high end of that. But what we're receiving is very, very poor. It's a wider discussion, but a discussion we cannot avoid. <clears throat> Tell me the, the, the question about economic transformation, I think flows from the answer I gave Tapello. If you look at, just start by looking at the unemployment statistics in this country, um, and the, the burden falls disproportionately on younger people, people under the age of 35. And then you can disaggregate that entire number and you will see that of those graduates, I think graduate unemployment now might be at somewhere between 12 and 15 percent. And then it keeps increasing so that people who don't finish grade 12, you're probably close to the 60 percent mark. Now if you have discouraged children in schools because this thing really becomes hard because there are teachers trying to teach mathematics that involves x's and y's and squares and square roots and so on and so on and you didn't learn to count when you were little and there are these big words on pages but you still can't read for meaning then your ability you will be discouraged you will not finish grade 12 you will not get into tertiary education and the idea of the past and you can look at where we've lost the majority of jobs. It's been in, in mining and agriculture and low-cost manufacturing. So we're deindustrializing and we don't have an alternative. By the same token, we haven't quite cracked how to separate out support for small businesses which is not the same as interest rates offered by Mashonisa. So the idea that people can actually start a small business, create employment and so on is another issue. The last point I want to raise, uh, uh, Tami, is that part of developing an economy that includes small business and inclusiveness is a fundamentally important objective is also about where people live. You know, and sometimes we must learn from people outside. There was a chap uh, who came, he was actually at MIT and he was part of a group that looked at the economy in South Africa and he went off and we were in Pretoria and he went off to Mamalodi with somebody. And he did some research and came back and said, you know, one of the biggest dividers in this country is that in almost every other developing country, people start businesses at home. So you start at home, you try and move into a kind of hive in the community long before you think of moving into an industrial area. But people can't run businesses at home because petty criminals 
prey on them. And so those stepping stones for businesses has been cut off by the nature of criminality where the majority of poor people live. So it's not just about big economic policy and these big ideological debates, Bungani, that we like to have. It's actually about trying to do little things that recognize what the impediments to development are. And Pumi, I'm going to tell you why I can't answer your question. Because we are involved in a legal process at the moment. But firstly, there are obligations that listed companies have. They must provide information to their shareholders and they must do so symmetrically. You can't favor one group of shareholders over others. And amongst you, I would hope that some of you are shareholders. And if I favor you this evening, then we would violate every rule of corporate governance. And because you've got to deal with information in a very symmetric way, I can't answer your question. It's not, it's not that I'm being difficult or anything like that. These are just the rules of the game. Failing which you end up like some of these companies. Some of these companies that uh, uh, have to ask for suspension because they've cooked books and stuff like that. You can't do that. And Paul, your question, if I understood it, was how did you get other people in the ministry to buy in? You know, it's... And, and the first place to start is, of course, in the ministry you run. And I ran the Ministry of Finance, but it, I had component parts to it. When I started out, we had separate departments of finance and state expenditure. We merged it to form a treasury. We had a separate revenue service. And then I was also, in fact, you know, people call, call me the longest serving minister of finance. I was the minister responsible for statistics. For 18 of the 20 years I was a minister. And so I have a very intimate knowledge of a man who wears a bright yellow suit <laughs> called Paddy Lehotla. <laughs> and I learned about statistics and statistical methodology by engaging with our statisticians every fortnight. But if you look at the construct, I mean, the, 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 what became the Treasury has a very interesting construct. There's one part of it which deals with public finance. Those, they have to evaluate every request from every, de every department. They have to engage with that department, evaluate the request, and put it before the rest of us. Then you have a budget office. The budget office must synthesize all of these things and evaluate what is possible. You have a macroeconomics team who must be able to take views from across the world and advise on where we are. You have an asset and liability unit that must look at what we can borrow and what, how much we can support state-owned enterprises by. Um, you have a unit that includes tax and financial regulation. And then you have an intergovernmental fiscal management unit. I think those are the core economics units. And once a fortnight, they must each be able to put up what they're doing and why. And that's through the year. And then, you know, you st the, a lot of what the budget is is a cyclical process. This year would be slightly odd because of uh, uh, it being an election here. But by next month, the Treasury must be able to get from every department what their desires are motivated. And it's horrible, it's wrangling. Because each of those departments and each of those ministers will say, between me and my dreams is that horrible man there. <laughs> and you, you take this together and you engage and buy, 
And then we also, we introduced something called the Minister's Committee on the Budget, which was a bit like this African peer review mechanism. You want, you, you set norms and you say, all right, we can deal with, you can deal with 5% uh, real, right? Anything beyond that. We invite those colleagues to come, not to one minister, to sit with a group of five or six ministers. At, no officials present. So now the ministers must talk numbers. Which is very difficult if your core skill is toy toy. <laughs> but it was, you see, you can, take, you can take this team building to a number of different levels. And once you pass that, then you're in a stronger position to place, place before. I was, I, I was very fortunate in that I had a lot of air cover from heads of state. I, 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 I regaled you with the stories of Madiba, and I think um, the, the stories of, of, of Tabo Beki were a different style. There'd be intense debates, and they'd say, will you and you come home, let's meet at 9.30. So we go to the house at 9.30, and sometimes you walk out there yawning at 3 o'clock in the morning. But he would allow us to settle our debates because that's how he thought necessary to construct <coughs> teamwork, esprit de corps. And then when you've got that, you see, it's not such a hard sell to other ministers. But also on a on a weekly basis because you've got cabinet meetings, you must be able to engage your colleagues because they come with submissions on a weekly basis that would have an impact later. Hmm? So it's how you keep this, and, and the other part of it is how you keep all those chickens called the provinces in the same yard. Yeah? <laughs> and we developed methods, you know, so that five, six times a year we met and every time we looked at the ac actual expenditure. And we could say to Limpopo, but you know, you asked for so much for education. Let's break it down for you. So much on wages or, or personnel costs, so much on learning materials, so much on infrastructure. You've not spent a dime of infrastructure. You're falling behind. You are subjecting children to mud schools. There are the numbers. You could do that because the analysis that we were able to do allowed for this to happen, but it did mean that you needed strong relations with the MECs and department to department in the provinces and hold this whole thing together. And then less frequently because they meant to, to, to generate more of their income, but less frequently, uh, but as significant would be the implementation of the Municipal Finance Management Act by bringing in the municipalities. When you let go of that, you have this problem that you're having in so many municipalities at the moment. Now, I didn't hear your name very clearly, but I thought I heard something like Kogila, no? No, there. Ping. Pintrita. Nitrita. Pikita. Okay. I apologize. It was just that I didn't hear you very well. You asked about the guardrails. For me, you know, there are there are very simple things that we need to get into our, our, our heads. And they work in two ways. I say I, I, I grew up poor. My mother, my father died when I was 13 years old. My mother has been a mainstay. Poor factory worker, but a mainstay. And I knew that if I, if I went off the rails myself, my mother would die of shame. The people I grew up with in my street would die of shame. 
I would be the biggest letdown that they ever had. That has been fundamentally important for me. I think it's kept me grounded. In a funny way, you know, when I made big speeches, now, the biggest speech that a Minister of Finance can make is a budget speech. Why? Because you're talking to, you're talking to grandmothers at home who are interested in the pension. They tuned into what you're saying. You're talking to members of parliament there who need to take decisions to support this as a law. You're talking to a gallery of all manner of people and you're talking to trading desks across the world because they are tuned into what you're saying and you need a single message. And constructing that message becomes quite an art form. You can get up and talk big economics and thrill poor people and they'll say, hey, clever. <laughs> but if you're talking to the hearts of people, you need to do something different. And part of that is, because you've got these thick books that are produced at the budget, but you need somebody who's listening to you. Who is the person who is listening to you and who needs to make sense of what you're saying. And it's not the smart trader on the trading desk reading uh, Pumi from Bloomberg's. It's not that one. <laughs> because they will buy and sell in a flash. It's constructing an audience who listens to you differently. And I think it is that that provides the guardrails. Why? because it gives meaning to the purpose of democracy. And the more we exclude people from understanding because we think that they are just too dim to understand it, the more we undermine our democracy and give, create conditions that Mfundo was talking about earlier because we are uncaring in our job. We lose the purpose of service. Thanks. Thank you so much. Let's give him another round of applause. We can do better, Madanda. Thank you so much. I'm sorry we can't take all the questions. Um, please follow us on Twitter, ULP, or Unleashing Leadership Potential. Follow us on all social you know, media platforms. We will reroute the questions to Mr. Trevor Manuel. Um, please follow us. You know the song that says, Ibiza Moyen. You know, just uh, leave your, your questions at Moyen. We'll, at, we'll attend to that. Can you give us your, just your closing remarks? Um, and then, uh, then we'll call our sp one of our sponsors just for a few minutes, and then we'll hand over to the chair. Well, thank you very much. This has been a great privilege for me. You see, by engaging in this way, we keep each other honest. Yeah. And, and part, of, part of dealing with this thing, I go back to, and I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm just not looking for, for praise because you know of the brother uh, Bungani, but his question about the ideological battle is a fundamentally important issue because what you can't do is stand on street corners and defend yourself. Part of what you hope you can communicate would be a set of messages about how we do things and why we do things. But the struggle is not over by a long chalk. You see, when I had the, I'm saying, you know, like this evening has been a privilege, I have had the rare privilege of being called to serve. And, and I'm happy for that to be evaluated, not by me, but by others. But after that long stint in the finance ministry, I was then afforded an opportunity to take, sit with 25 other people and draft a vision for our future. 
National Development Plan, we started out with the diagnostic and go back and look at the diagnostic. And the question that I try to answer Tapelo is the education question. And amongst things, we try to communicate in graphics online, on YouTube, is the story of Tandi. This girl who grows up poor and who remains poor, and the first time she earns something akin to a living wage is when she goes on pension at the age of 63. That story still lives with us. If you go back into the National Development Plan, unfulfilled as it is in implementation, one of the core issues there is what we call the elements of a decent standard of living. Access to health care that closes the gap between that which is available in private and public centers, the sectors. Access to education and training, access to employment, access to housing, water and sanitation, access to cheap affordable public transport, access and the right to recreation, the right to a clean environment. Um, there are Ten of those basic, the, the right to it, the right and responsibilities for employment. There are ten objectives like that. They're not outlandish. They shouldn't be unaffordable. But what this country needs is a debate about where the floor is and how that floor rises. What has happened in large part in this country is in significant parts the floor has fallen. You look at the lives of people in many townships, especially in rural areas, no access to proper accommodation, no access to clean, drinkable water, no access to sanitation. Healthcare is a pipe dream. You look at those things and you say the floor has fallen for too many South Africans. That is our conscience. That is the guardrails that we must set up for ourselves. We must design the benchmarks and say, how do we deliver this? How do we expect government to deliver it? And we must have honest conversations about these things, failing which, failing which we don't honor the sacrifices of those, especially those who gave their lives to bring democracy to this country. Thank you. Thank you so much. Let's give him a round of applause. Thank you so much. We can do better than that. We can do much better than that. We can do much better than that. Thank you so, so much. Thank you so much. Powerful stuff. Powerful stuff. Powerful stuff. Thank you so much, Mr. Trevor, no, uh, uh, Trevor Manuel, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Trevor, no, I was a state semi trendela but thank you so much, Mr. Manuel. Powerful stuff. Thank you for, for delivering a, a paradigm and a destiny-shifting, inspirational um, lecture. Let's give him another round of applause. Thank you. That was powerful. Uh, guys from Market Fire Day here, can you just call? Oh, oh, Baba. Was I was also Kuluma and I was Tengese. Remember, don't forget to have this postcard. It's on the table. Make sure that you do have it. And then on the 4th of July, we have a, a master class. It's a free master class at uh, Old Mutual. It's such a, it's not a, co it's a, such a coincidence. But at Old Mutual, you know, uh, the auditorium for 200 executives, it's a free master class. But please make sure that you talk to Mr. Mnyageni. And if you want to attend some of these courses, also talk to him or myself. Rotman, is a bias again now. Good evening. So I have five minutes to explain what happens when unstoppable force collides with immovable object. I'm going to need your help and your attention. Um, my name is Raymond uh, Tsetsewa. I'm the founder and one of the directors of Marketify Group, 
Marketify Group, it's a digital marketing agency, a leading digital marketing agency in the healthcare, education, and home improvement industries. Um, it's funny that uh, while I was driving here, I was reminded why we started the business. I was listening to radio, and they were speaking about the unemployment rate in South Africa, especially uh, amongst the youth that is sitting at over 55%. Shocking stats, right? Um, and I usually, I, I ask myself, when we started the businesses, what can we do to help businesses market themselves better, especially online? These are the services that we provide. We build mobile apps for small businesses. We help uh, develop websites. We also help with uh, PPC. PPC is pay-per-click advertising. So how can you get people, or how can you get your website to rank high on social media or even on your search engines when people are looking for products and services that you're offering? We also, I'm gonna go straight into online reputation management. So there's a lot of businesses that are marketing themselves very well. However, they don't know when people or their customers are complaining about their services or products online. They have no idea. We have a solution that can help you whenever your company is mentioned or one of your directors or your employees are mentioned online. The system can pick that up and send you a notification so that you can be able to attend to that client or customer of yours. We can move on. I call this the breaking slides because, um, so those are some of the clients that we, we have worked with or we're still working with, some of them. Um, but I call it a breaking slide because it's not about those clients, it's about what we can do for your business, which leads me to the next slide. So we are offering a, a free digital marketing consultation to the entrepreneurs that are available here or business owners that are available here. If you know that you need digital marketing um, services, it's always a struggle that we get that a lot of people just think by having a website and having social media channels, you're done. There's a lot that goes into that. Actually, your website's supposed to be your sales representative, supposed to get you business. Your social media um, channel is supposed to help to drive traffic to your website. And we can tell you how to do that in the most engaging and the most profitable manner. So visit the website, um, www.marketify.co.za forward slash free and sign up for a free consultation where one of our consultants will give you a call and help you to define a winning digital uh, marketing strategy. Thank you so much for the attention. Quick announcement, this coming Saturday, we have Empower Youth uh, Entrepreneurial Leadership Summit. It's happening at Orange Farm. We also want to say thank you, Babu Moritz and Khadebe, for ULP also for sponsoring. We are hosting close to a thousand young people. If you want to support us, make sure that you talk to me. I think that's it. Let's welcome our chair just to give a vote of thanks and then also give us matching orders. Asim Shayan in Izatla. You still maintain your characteristics as a leader, but you relate to those that you have taught to lead. You bridge the divide between self and other self, between me and community, between person and people. You make those distinctions. That way, you will not become an element in the crucible. You still remain a, a Be catalyst. Before you can lead, you must learn how to follow. Because you are not a leader all the time. At another level, you are part of another team that's led by somebody else. But it can't be forever. It's better to negotiate before you lose power. 
integrity from a leadership perspective is totally indispensable because unless that is embedded, uh, you then fail to control how everything else basically evolves. Hard work, commitment, and passion are fundamental. Uh, so if you've got clarity of purpose, you've got to know that to meet that purpose, you've got to sacrifice, you've got to work hard. There are no easy decisions. If the decisions were easy, you did not need leaders to take decisions. We could all take our own decisions and do anything we like. Even ship need a shepherd. Uh, there are no easy decisions for leadership. Uh, they are all complex but they all have consequences. So our choices as leaders have consequences. We must stand and take responsibility for the consequences of the choices and the decisions that we make. Make sure that you work yourself out of the job from day one. Make yourself out of the job, out of the job, so that you open up space for some other people to come in. Otherwise, you're gonna start hogging and hoarding things and you'll destroy the organization. And that is why we can never build institutions because you think that the institution is you. You are just a passing phase. You do your time, you do your shift, and you move on. And then of course leaders also bring new people into their immediate team and into the organization they are charged with leading. It would be very strange if they didn't bring new people in. And I think a team is like a dam. Uh, Water has got to flow out, and water has got to flow in for the dam to remain uh, vital. This is a very big part I've felt for leadership, is that when people see that you do stuff on purpose, and you do it with conviction, they also buy into the, uh, what you do. Intuition is, is that, that thing that tells you that something is right, even though you don't have the evidence to prove it. And then you've got to have some courage. You, you can't go in if you're afraid. If you're afraid of failure, you'll never be an entrepreneur because there's just too many risks, too many dangers. And if you're afraid to fail, it, it, you're going to struggle. So I can now give back. And I learned a lesson from a friend in India who retired about the same time as I did. And I said, Nagesh, what are you going to do? He said, Simon, I've spent roughly the first 30 years of my life learning I've spent the second 30 years earning, and the last 30 years I'm going to do a lot of returning. Being, being thoughtful about the impact that you will have beyond your tenure, beyond the time that you are there, because that's the ultimate marker of leadership. How will this place be like, feel like, look like when I'm gone? And actually, how do I manage it, contribute to it in such a way that when I'm gone, it's actually a lot better than when I was here? Our entrepreneurs are in all industries. So we don't tell you what you ought to be doing. You tell us what you are going to be doing. Because ultimately, you are the one that has to produce the results. You are the one that needs to make sure that you're driving your targets. Um, you're growing your business, you're employing your people, you are doing all the right things. And one of the things that is important for us is that we make sure that all our entrepreneurs are very much in tune and, you know, complying with all the regulatory requirements. And so the journey has had many, many lessons for me. The first lesson was that no education is useless. It's how you use it once you have it. The second lesson was have the humility to admit that while you are good at certain things, you're not good at everything. And embrace the fact that you do not know everything because that's what helps you engage other people. Other people like it when you say, you know, I, I've watched you at the board meeting and I love the way that you think and I, you know, you're so good with the numbers. Won't you just explain this for me? And if you have the humility to admit that you don't know certain things, people are more willing to help you. That's another lesson I got. 
As I said, the other lesson is to grasp every opportunity that you have, every door that opens actually opens you up to new opportunities that you didn't even know you could reach. So grasp it and add value wherever you are. While it may be difficult times, but somewhere in the difficult times, there's always an opportunity. Yes, there is risk, but there's always an opportunity. And you as a leader, number 16, you must build that motivating and motivated staff. Create that environment conducive for people to dream big, even when there is a nightmare, a morning man, an afternoon man, but they still dream big. Now. <laughs> That's what we are here. Dream big. I want to see great dreams. Uh, in the next 10, 15 years, people sitting around this place will be running great companies global companies, ministers, cabinet, president. Do you believe that? Yes. Do you believe that? Yes. Hey, clap hands. I'm clapping hands for you, man. This, this nation needs you, needs you, needs you. Leaders that are authentic, leaders of integrity. And I'm sure that the European is contributing in a small way in that direction. I want to talk to you, my brother, when you finish here. Okay. All right. Again, Baba Man, thank you very much. Oh, this was so awesome. We learn about intricacies. Why don't you give another round of applause? <laughs> you know, uh, you, 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 you took us into the intricacies of running government. It was such a privilege. And we had a similar situation when uh, Dr. Frank Chicano was here. Took us in the intricacies of, of being in a... In a, in a Office of the President. So we really thank you. Uh, the next uh, uh, sessions that we're going to be having, I'm talking about, has been predominantly male, and I've been accused here that I'm not gender sensitive. And uh, it's struggling to get uh, ladies. Uh, so can you also ask uh, Ms. Ramos uh, <laughs> for me? Because I did uh, touch her office, but I don't know whether she, uh, she knows what we're doing here. But now you know. You can speak. Uh, give me a, give me a, give me a good word so that when my office comes there, uh, she'll say, no, 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 I know you help me. <laughs> uh, have you got the, the, the event? This is a very important event. You know that I spend uh, all my working life in oil and gas. Uh, we've got an oil and gas seminar which we run here at ULP. It's on which date, uh, Theo? 3rd of August. We run it with Empower Works. Uh, I've been leading it for many, many years, all this now. Now, the champion of it is Priscilla Mabelane. She's the first woman CEO of BP South Africa. Let's give her a round of applause. <laughs> I challenged her and I said, I'm giving you this big tone and she took the big tone and she's going to be leading. She's going to be the face of women in oil and gas. And it's always because I spend most of my working life in that space, I always like to invite people to come into it. Now, in fact, not only oil and gas, energy, because energy is such a complex thing. It's electricity, it's gas, it's renewable, it's all the smart grids that we're talking about and, uh, and in this changing world. So please come and it's specifically for, for, for ladies. All right. Next one who's coming here is uh, Mujanku Gumb, advocate. She was a legal advisor for the president, Tabo Begi. Uh, looking forward to hear some very intricate uh, uh, stories about uh, uh, being in government. And Deborah was instrumental in inviting her. Deborah, please give Deborah a round of applause. <laughs> See, last time I made an appeal, I said, ladies, please tell me uh, and help me invite ladies is so that you don't accuse me. And she said, I'm in. And she spoke to her. And uh, Rick Manel, former executive chairman of Angloval. Angloval is one of the great uh, uh, mining company and his family has been around the country. And uh, he's gracefully want to come and just share uh, his uh, experience as a business leader in this country and contributing a lot uh, running the investment vehicle of uh, the family. And then we're also very fortunate. Last, year, last time we had a season son, and now we've got Judy, uh, the Chancellor of the University of Vet Rogers Rand is on the 8th of October. Wow, let's give a, a round of applause. 
So diarize these dates because you can see it gets very full very quickly. I think we'll need to increase this auditorium very soon. And then we also, we're starting the ULP governance and I'd say again Deborah is here uh, and uh, we're launching it on the 20th of July and there'll be sessions and then very soon I'm going to start watching the, the social media. And here what we want to do is really focus, it's going to be on Saturdays, those people who want to really understand what's the conflict of interest, which is tripping so many of us here. Well, what is the uh, 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 issues that you've got to deal with ethical conduct? How do you run a, a business uh, that is not going to get trapped by all sorts of uh, legal compliance? Uh, and, 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 and it's so important because we want leaders, that, business people that are here, run clean businesses. I'm telling you, integrity ensures sustainability of your business. I don't care how successful you are, but if you're short term, you're going to come down like a ton of bricks. I've been in business for 30 years. I've seen this. So very important. That's why we wanted to do that. And that's it uh, for now. And uh, thank you very much. Let me see here. I've got my instructions. Uh, market file is already here. All the announcements we've made. Uh, we're going to have a networking session right now. So there is a coffee outside. And, uh, and just make sure that you've met two or three people and you've given them their business card and you also network because we're creating a community of uh, business uh, leaders and community leaders and professionals that will work together. Uh, may I take this opportunity to wish you all the best and God bless you.